Hi everyone, today I'm going to read chapter 14 of Restart. Um, credit goes to the author Gordon Corman, an online um, publisher, um, recorded books for letting me do this. So this is chapter 14 and it's titled Chase Ambrose. So this, the perspective from this chapter, or me as the, the person reading it, the narrator, I am Chase. My dad recently bought himself a souped up Mustang with 400 horsepower, huge tires, and just enough of a defect in the muffler that it roars like a bulldozer. That's what he drives when he isn't in the Ambrose electric truck. He won't be caught dead in Corinne's van. And he assures me when I'm 16, my first lesson will be, will be behind the much loved wheel of the sting, of the Stang. I hope not, I tell him, because I won't be able to make out a single word over the engine noise. He laughs appreciatively. You won't be able to hear a police siren either, but you'll be able to outrun one. We pull up in front of my house and he kills the engine so we can hear each other scream. Thanks for dinner, Dad. Corinne's a great cook. The best. Helene's really fun too. I guess we're turning into pretty good friends. He grimaces. Because you played princess with her? Yeah, well, we were going to have an ultimate fighting match, but we wouldn't. We couldn't find an octagon. Dad doesn't crack a smile. I guess you never struck me as the kind of kid who'd care whether or not he's pretty good friends with a four-year-old. I shrug. She used to be afraid of me. Isn't this better? She wasn't afraid of you exactly, but you were very different then. Tougher. Nobody messed with you. Think of Aaron and Bear like that. I'm having flashbacks of my wonderful toughness, punching and shoving kids, kicking their heels out from under them in the halls, but it's not all bad stuff like that. I remember walking through the school with my shoulders back and my head held high. I remember feeling important and confident and powerful. Maybe some of that came off from, maybe some of that came from what a jerk I was, but surely not all of it. I was a star athlete and a state champion. I had a lot of friends. I was somebody in this town. It's not a crime to be proud of that. I reach for the door handle. Anyway, thanks again, Dad. One more thing, champ, he says quickly. There's this doctor. He's a sports medicine expert, so he has a lot more experience than that quack Copperman. Um, Cooperman, sorry. I talked to his office, and he's willing to take a look at you to give you us a second opinion. A second opinion, I echo? We know exactly what happened to me. What's a second opinion going to do? Get you on the field where you belong, he exclaims immediately. Even Copperman admits, Cooperman admits you're, you've recovered. It shouldn't cost you your whole season. Dr. Cooperman explained all that, I remind him. You know, abundance of caution, blah, blah, blah. And if that's the right move, Dr. Nugent will tell you the same thing. But if it's not, you're throwing away your eighth grade year. Maybe another state championship. Nobody's ever won two in a row. Not even me. His face is flushed with passion. There's no doubt in my mind that he's 100% sincere. Even more amazing, he's talking about me surpassing what he accomplished on the Hurricanes. Obviously, there's a lot I can't remember, but for him to, su to suggest I might go beyond him, that he might be second best after me, that's huge. How could I not see this Nugent guy? He's a specialist, which means he knows more about sports injuries than anybody, including Dr. Cooperman. If he gives me the okay to play, then nobody can stop me. I'll tell mom, I promise. God, no, he explodes. When I, gaw when I gawk at him, he adds, we don't want to worry her. She's got enough on her mind. I'll take you to Dr. Nugent, and when we get the all clear, then we'll find a way to bring it up to your mother. I don't want to get my hopes up too high. You mean, if we get the clear, I amend? Whatever, but I've got a good feeling about this champ. You'll have your old life back before you know it. My old life. I allow my mind to sift through the idea. I'm excited to play football, but what I really crave is the chance to be me again. To make up to make up with my best friends and mend fences with the team. Those feelings of self-assuredness and pride won't just come from memories anymore. It could all happen very soon. So now um, there's this line here that has kind of been in the book a few times um, since I started reading it, but I never talked to you guys about it. It kind of indicates like it's still the same chapter, but it indicates now it's like a new scene. So he's no longer, you know, um, with his dad having the conversation about seeing the, um, the sports injury doctor. So now it's like another scene. Bear snatches the pass out of the air, hugs the ball close to his body and execute and executes a lightning spin around a lady pushing a baby carriage on the sidewalk. Watch it, she barks as, as the startled baby begins to scream. Sorry, 
I shout over my shoulder and we continue along Portland Street, tossing the ball between the three of us. I'm not back on the team yet, but no one said I couldn't play a friendly game of catch as we make our way to community service. The friendly part is just for us. It doesn't include our fellow pedestrians who run for their lives when they see us coming. Hey, cut it out. Watch where you're going. That's my head you almost took off. A 10-year-old kid lets loose a string of obscenities when we knock him off his bike. You kiss your mother with that mouth, Aaron crows gleefully. Laughing, I haul the kid and his bike upright and turn back just in time to see the ball screaming at my face. At the last second, I reach up and pick it out of the air. Not bad, I think to myself. Maybe I really am the star everyone says I used to, says I used to be. Aaron and Bear are all power and no finesse. Aaron's even kind of a butterfingers. He's constantly running into the road after the bouncing ball amid squealing breaks and honks of outrage. But I see, I, but I'm, but I seem to have some real skills and what Dad would call good hands. Great catch, Ambrose. Aaron bellows. Now you see how much the Hurricanes need you. I grin, but don't tell them about the appointment Dad's going to set up with Dr. Nugent. I don't want them celebrating something that might not happen if the new doctor doesn't clear me to play. But he's going to. I can feel it. When we get to Portland Street residence, I spy Shoshana just stepping in the front door. Luckily, Aaron's looking the other way, and I throw Bear a bullet pass to make sure he doesn't see her. It wouldn't be easy to explain to those guys that she and I are working together. I don't have a timesheet to sign, so when they head to the office, I make a beeline for Mr. Solway's room. I'll have to catch up with them at, them at some point, but the way they goof off and eat cookies, I've got plenty of time. I don't feel great about running around behind their backs, but it's easier this way. Why stir things up if I don't have to? So now there's that line again, right? So I'm pretty sure that now they are going to be in, um, in, doc in Mr. Solway's room. So the, so the colonel is lecturing us on conserving resources and right behind him on the landing strip, the, the PFCs are unloading the six coolers of pastrami sandwiches we had flown in from San Francisco. And we're praying he doesn't turn around because we sent two pilots over 12,000 miles, including a stop at the Midway Islands, to get us lunch. We're breaking our arms, patting ourselves on the back that we got away with it. When the colonel sniffs the air and says, call me crazy, but I could swear I smell pastrami. I cling harder to the flip cam so my laughter won't make the picture jump. I can see that Shoshana, the interviewer, is actually biting the side of her mouth to keep from cracking up. You don't want to do anything to interrupt Mr. Solway. Once he gets started, the stories tumble out, one after another. It's our third day at Portland Street working with the old soldier and our best yet. Shoshana never plans on spending more than a couple hours here, but neither of us counted on Mr. Solway having so much to say. Most of the time, he's all sarcasm, so it's hard to have a normal conversation with him. The big difference is Shoshana, who's a natural interviewer. She's so genuinely interested that she brings out the best in Mr. Solway. Some of the stories are sad, like losing friends in battle or having to rescue children orphaned by the war. Some are uplifting, the work of medics and nurses and the incredible heroism of ordinary soldiers. But amazingly, in the middle of all that suffering and violence, a lot of funny stuff happened too like the pastrami incident or the time General MacArthur's laundry was sent to their post by mistake and they, and they used his silk boxer shorts as party has on New Year's Eve. I get the impression that Mr. Solway was the Army's version of a class clown, which doesn't really match the cranky old geezer he is now. Or maybe it does. I think of his mistrust of authority figures like doctors and administrators. He saw almost as many of those during the war as he does today in assisted living. After he took out out that tank, he spent five weeks in the hospital. He was nearly court-martialed for running an illegal gambling operation. He filled empty IV bags with helium and took bets on balloon races. While he's telling it to Shoshana, he's roaring with laughter. His face is pink from the joy of the memory. I had 50 bucks on the hot water bottle. That was a lot of money in those days. And this crazy Texan threw a hyper a hypodermic needle and in like a dart and brought me down three feet shy of the finish line. I've never been so mad at anybody in my life, but I paid up. At least I was going to until the MPs raided the game party poopers. Engrossed in the story, I nearly missed the twin ga uh, gasps from the hall. I glance over my shoulder to spy Aaron and Bear standing in the doorway, staring in bewilderment. Busted. Let's take a break, okay? I set down the camera and join them outside. What gives, Bear demands. First, you come with us to community service when you don't have to. That's bad enough. But now you're making a movie about the place? 
It's for video club. And with Shoshana Weber, Aaron cuts me off. Her stupid family got us sentenced to the, to the Graybeard Motel. Maybe I'm trying to make things right with her. I defend myself. Maybe if I help her with her project, the family will be in more of a forgiving mood. Yeah, that'll work, Aaron snorts. Listen, man, you might not remember how much the Webbers hate our guts, but I do. If it was up to them, we wouldn't be on community service. We'd be on death row. But hey, it's all good. If you want to spend your time with people who curse the day you were born instead of your true friends, it's not like we can stop you. I'm torn. On one hand, I'm not doing anything wrong. Still, I've kind of brought this on myself by covering up the fact that I'm working with Shoshana. Aaron looks honestly hurt, like I'm stabbing him in the back. And let's face it, he might be kind of right. After all, I didn't have to be so secretive about the video project. Bear chimes in. And of all the Dumbledores in this place, why do you have to pal around with that one? If you're looking for relics, this place is like an all-you-can-eat buffet. Why him? We're interviewing him, I try to explain. He's the most interesting person here. The guy's a war hero. They stare at me like I've got cabbage for a head through a long, weird silence. Finally, Aaron mumbles, yeah, you showed us the picture. The way you ignore all the residents here, I figured maybe you forgot. Yeah, well, we didn't, Bear Snaps. We know all about Mr. Steinway. Solway, I correct. Aaron is annoyed. Listen, when you're practicing football three hours a day and doing community service because you have to, not because it's your hobby, you've got a lot more on your mind than remembering every old, every old coot's name. Come on, Bear. Look who's talking about forgetting, Bear adds resentfully as they head down the hall. Way to go, Chase. I chew myself out as they round the corner. This is exactly what I was trying to avoid, and now they're ticked off at me. Worse, they feel like they can't trust me anymore. What next, huh? When I re-enter the room, the first thing I see is Mr. Solway's walker standing against the wall. The old soldier himself is up on his feet, directing Shoshana, who was pulling a heavy box out of the closet. You know, she's saying, I thought being in the army taught people to be more orderly. Mr. Solway throws his head back and guffles loudly. I'm the exception to that rule. Some of the fellows, to this day, they make a bed so tight you could bounce a quarter off the blanket. Me? I always hated the spit and polish. I promised myself that the minute there was no sergeant around to search for a speck of dust on my boots, I was going to be as messy as I wanted to be. Well, in that case, Shoshana informs him, this closet is your crowning glory. Instead of being insulted, the old soldier looks kind of pleased. I can see it from all the way across the room. There are a few shirts pairs of pants, and one suit on hangers push over to one side. The rest of the space, 90% of it, is jam-packed with what can only be, be described as stuff. Picture the entire contents of a house crammed into a tiny 4x4 four four space. All the things that would end up in the basement, the garage, the attic, live in that closet. There are books, ping-pong paddles, a broom, a couple of bowling trophies, hip wa uh, waders, and a fishing rod, Framed pictures, a weed whacker, ice skates, a three-foot-high oriental vase with a crack upside, up the side, a golf umbrella, a garden gnome, luggage, and cartons of vary, varying sizes. As I cross the room, I get a peek inside the box that Shoshana dragged out. It contains three replacement furnace filters, jumper cables for a car, and a sterling silver nutcracker set. It looks like exactly what it is the things a person collects over 86 years. And when that person moves to a place where all the storage space is one little closet, it gets pretty tight in there. We've got a lot of great footage of Mr. Solway talking, Shoshana explains to me from the depths of the collection, but what we need are some visuals to cut away to. Mementos, old photographs, that kind of thing. What do you think? When we're talking project business, she sometimes slips up and treats me like a fellow human. Good idea, I agree. Mr. Solway peers into another box. Son of a gun, I was wondering what I did with my 32-piece ratchet set. I look at him standing up and walking on his own, even bending over to see inside the carton. It's hard to believe that this is the same Mr. Solway that I first met, struggling on the walker and never even bothering to open the blinds to let some light into his gloomy room. Maybe when his wife died and he moved into Portland Street, he lost focus because everything in his life used to revolve around her. But now that Shoshana and I are coming over to work on the video, he's totally different. He wants to present himself well on camera, so he shaves, dresses well, stands straighter, and walks better. According to the nurses, his appetite has improved at mealtime. 
We dig around some more, moving stuff out of the closet and unpacking boxes until the floor is covered in knickknacks. We do find a few things we can use in the video, black and white photographs from the barracks in Korea, the Solway's wedding picture and a double frame with one from their 50th anniversary, his old military dog tags and another set belonging to a buddy who was killed in the war. We've got enough, but Shoshana is like a bloodhound on her hands and knees in the closet, running her hands along the baseboard. What are you doing back there? Mr. Solway asks, drilling for oil. She reaches behind a golf bag and draws out a navy blue, a navy blue velvet jewelry box of, of an odd triangular shape. Embossed in silver on the lid is the great seal of the United States. <gasps> you found my medal, Mr. Solway exclaims in amazement. Glowing with discovery, Shoshana flips open the cover. The box is empty. Mr. Solway frowns. Aw, it must have fallen out. Shoshana and I give the closet floor a thorough inspection. No medal. She has a question. Mr. Solway, when was the last time you wore your medal? In this place, he's sarcastic. Lots of state occasions here. Wheelchair races, canister games, colonoscopies. What, a, what about before that, before you moved here? He casts a, a wry grin. I get you. What if the crazy old old codger packed up the empty case for a medal he lost 20 years ago? No, don't apologize. It's a valid question. The answer is, I never wore it. Not that I was ashamed of it, but I didn't feel right. Like I'd be saying, look how great I am. I've got a better medal than you. Any dimwit can win a Purple Heart. My wife used to take it out once a year on Veterans Day. And when I refused to wear it, she'd polish it up and put it away again. Maybe one time she misplaced it. She was confused, toward, confused towards the end. It's possible. He retreats to his easy chair and sits in silence. Talking about his wife always makes him sad. We quit filming early in order to leave our subject with his memories. I love Mr. Solway, but he's pretty weird, Shoshana says as we cross the lobby heading for the exit. He won his country's highest honor and basically ignored it. People were different back then, I offer. You know, more modest. Yeah, sure, modest, but to care so little that you don't even bother to open the case to see if the metal's still there and then hide it in the back of your closet behind a golf bag? You've got to be a real oddball. We're going through the sliding doors, which might be why she ha she doesn't notice that I stagger for a split second. Missing metal. Empty case buried under tons of junk. Mr. Solway's metal wasn't lost. It was stolen. Somebody pocketed it and tossed the case where it would be hard to find. Who would do such a thing? There are plenty of possibilities. Portland Street is a busy place with a big staff. Doctors, nurses, attendants, service people. There were painters in there recently. It could have been one of the other residents or even a visitor. But as I run my mind over the range of suspects, an image keeps forcing itself in front of my eyes. I see a $20 bill in Mrs. Swanson's shaky hand. I see greedy fingers snatching it away. I hope you guys remember from the earlier chapter when the older lady tried to tip Aaron, Bear, and Chase, and she gave them a $20 bill. And remember, Chase gave it back to her, like from his own pocket, uh, and Aaron and Bear kept it, and they went to go buy, buy pizza with it. So Chase is kind of making a connection now, okay? Bear and Aaron gloating over all the pizza it would buy. Of course, there's a big difference between 20 bucks and the decoration awarded to a war hero to honor his bravery above and beyond the call of duty. But somebody greedy enough to take money from a confused old lady who thinks she's tipping room service? How could a guy like that pass up the chance to get his hands on something far more valuable? I must, I must turn pale because Shoshana regards me in concern. Are you okay? You look like you're about to face plant. I'm fine. I am so not fine, but I keep my mouth shut. What kind of friend am I that I instantly suspect Aaron and Bear of stealing Mr. Solway's medal? What kind of friends are they that it's so easy for me to believe they did it? Two hard questions followed by a third. What should I do now? Big chapter for us. We kind of figured out where the medal is. Stay tuned for more.